And tonight's speaker is Stan. I'm going to ask you to pronounce your last name. It's like fish. Very good. So tonight's speaker is Stan Fish. His photographic journey started in the 1960s with a hand-me-down nicer mat, but because of his love for scuba diving and marine tropical reef ecology, his equipment and images became dedicated to underwater nature. By 2010, it was time to hang up the fins, and when he joined Northern Virginia Photographic Society, he was exposed to a whole new world of land-based photography. Still, nature remained a driving force behind his images. At MVPS, Stan has served on multiple committees and is a past president. He's given multiple talks to the club and to several local clubs as well. And in the past, he enjoyed teaching underwater photography, but over the past six years, he's helped lead photo tours in Florida, New Mexico, Washington State, Alaska, and Yellowstone National Park. Of his 14 trips to Yellowstone, five have been during the winter, including this past January. The winter season rapidly became his favorite time of the year to visit the park, and while by, by far, this, in a way, this is the most challenging season to be in Yellowstone, it can be the most rewarding. Tonight, Stan's going to talk about why Yellowstone in the winter is such a magical place, how and where you can get the best images, some techniques for shooting in the winter, and how to try it and stay warm in a region that routinely records the lowest temperatures in the lower 48 states. Tonight, Stan Bish. All right, let's see if we can get this correct. First, um, everybody can hear me. I can hear you and see your screen. Okay, and are you gonna mute everybody? Yes, sir, everybody but you is muted. Okay. Um, first and foremost, let me just say that uh, we have a new 10 week old puppy. Um, and so if you hear some barking in the background, this youngster is a uh, rescue dog from the island of Curacao, of which you'll hear more about in a little bit. So I was, I was thinking um, today as I was sort of putting the last bits of the, the uh, talk together that we've had somewhat of a prolonged winter even here in Virginia. And, and after the last two warm days, probably the last thing anybody wants to hear about is more winter. But be that as it may, the talk tonight is about Yellowstone in the winter. And uh, why would you go when it's so cold? Well, um, I thought I would talk a little bit about my personal photographic history and how that got me to Yellowstone and my experiences in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and why I learned to love Yellowstone in the winter and how I tried to stay warm. The cell phone picture here on the right was taken on my very first winter day in Yellowstone at Madison Junction. And that is a minus 20 at 1230. Um, it was minus 38 at night and it was 28 at dawn when we were out in the park. And that was my first introduction to Yellowstone uh, in the winter. Um, it's not always that cold. Uh, this past January when I was there, we had balmy days in the 20s, um, which are certainly much more acceptable, but you have to be prepared to be really cold. Um, I got my first camera in the 60s, um, and in 1973, when I was in medical school in New York, I decided that I, want to buy, I wanted to buy my own camera, and there was a new store that had opened by the Schreiber brothers, uh, Blimey and Herman, and that was B&H Photo. And I think I bought a camera from one of those brothers, but in any case, it was a Canon F1 uh, single lens reflex camera. Um, and I used that to take casual uh, pictures. Uh, but as John said in the introduction, I also had this love of coral reef ecology. And I have no idea where that came from other than watching Mike Nelson sea hunt on TV as a kid. Neither of my parents can swim, and I don't ever remember seeing them in an ocean. Um, nonetheless, while I was on a rotation in uh, a hospital in New York, uh, there was a YMCA next door, and I got certified in scuba diving. And any little time that I had off, I was diving in quarries um, in Pennsylvania and New York. 
And uh, if I had any vacation at all, I would try to go to Florida and dive. Um, when I got married uh, late in my residency and then later moved to the Eastern shore of Virginia to practice, uh, thankfully my wife liked warm places. And we, if we had vacation time, would try to go to some place in the Caribbean so that I could dive. And it wasn't long before I bought a Nikonis 5 camera, which is a, a rangefinder camera made specifically for being underwater. Uh, it's sealed with O-rings, you put film in it, and I'll show you one later when we get off of the talk. But um, I started taking pictures and then I was hooked. And so for the next 40 years, I was doing underwater photography. When my wife and I retired, I moved to the, we moved to the island of Curacao. We ran away from home. Our kids were grown. We sold everything in the United States, packed up a 40 foot uh, container and, uh, and moved to Curacao. Curacao is part of the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao, off the coast of Venezuela. It's fairly far south, so it's out of the hurricane belt. In fact, it's a desert island. Um, and Pictured here is a Nikon D3S in an aquatica housing with strobes, which are underwater flashes. And it is possible to put a camera in a housing and it's sealed with O-rings um, and it has buttons on the outside. And every time you push a button, it communicates by pushing the um, same button on the camera body. Um, the problem with that is, is that every time you buy a new camera, you have to buy a new housing because the cameras um, change enough that you have to um, get one that will run your um, camera. So the body, the housings cost just as much as the camera body. So you don't change cameras lightly. Um, when we moved back to the States in 2010, um, Diving had been so easy for me, um, just threw my stuff in an old pickup truck and I was in the water. And now I was living in Old Town Alexandria and the thought of packing scuba gear and clothes and cameras and lenses and underwater housings and strobes and batteries and chargers, it just lost all its appeal. And so I hung up my fins. Um, and started to think about transitioning to land photography. And today some would say that I'm a bird photographer, um, which is true, but I also enjoy all elements of photography, but it shouldn't be surprising that I'd be attracted to birds because it's just like taking pictures of fish. Um, and so uh, I'm not surprised anyway that I gravitated to birds. Underwater photography can certainly be a hair raising experience. Certainly when you get underwater, you're on a life support system. And so you need to be an accomplished diver before you start thinking about f-stops and strobe settings. Um, and you need to be a, a good diver so that you're not bouncing into the reef uh, because of current and hitting coral and breaking coral um, and scaring fish. Um, so it takes some time to get um, good enough as a diver to be an underwater photographer. And when I got to Curacao, um, I started working for dive shops and I started teaching and I started working for the department, their, their department of tourism. Um, and teaching was quite a bit of fun. And here's a student who didn't get the message to check all your equipment the night before, before you're in a hurry on the boat to get into your scuba gear. Because had he taken a picture with his camera on dry land the night before, he would have had noted a dark LCD screen on the back of his camera. Instead, he came up to me in the water, showed me his LCD screen perplexed. And I looked at the front of his camera and he'd left the lens cap on and you can't change your lens cap in 60 feet of water. Um, and so teaching was really, quite enjoyable. Um, this gentleman actually was the father of one of the dive masters that I worked with and uh, it was really a great fellow and became a great friend. Working for the dive shops was fun. I never got paid cash 
but I never paid for a dive. And all the years that I lived in Curacao, my diving was free. I got free air, free boat trips. Um, and I bartered my pictures um, uh, for um, working with the uh, dive shops. Um, this image of Bogats going, the school of Bogats went on for about five minutes and uh, go across this coral reef. And this was used by the tourism industry as well um, in one of their journals. It sort of reminds you of the starling pictures that you see of the masses of starlings that, um, that form various shapes uh, in the air. I did get a chance to dive also in the Pacific um, and uh, it's a completely different environment. Uh, and the only thing that I regret at all of my diving is that I didn't get to do a coffee table book on clownfish. I love the symbiotic relationship between clownfish and the anemone. These anemones are basically stationary jellyfish with stinging tentacles. The clownfish are immune to the stings and they live in there and they are these pugnacious little fish of many different colors and sizes. Um, and I really, really enjoy photographing them. I did start doing land photography a little bit in Curacao because Curacao has all of these festivals. And Carnival, um, I think is going on almost right now, is their version of Mardi Gras. And it's a week long drink fest where teams of people um, decide what costume and they make their own costumes and compete as teams. And they, the final event is a night parade um, and it's a great place to do slow shutter speed uh, photography with, uh, with flash. The other uh, festival that I really loved uh, is once a year, it's called SEAU, S-E-A-U, which is a celebration of the Antillean heritage of uh, the Corsu uh, people. They are just uniformly attractive people. Um, and photographing their traditional dress and eating their traditional foods is always a, a great weekend. Um, this was a, a cover shot for one of the uh, tourism magazines. So what I learned from all the time underwater is, is that I really photographically was driven by my love for the natural world. I love to study reef ecology, learn where the fish lived, what they did, how they grew, uh, what corals you could find in what locations. Um, it was, and when you can dive every day, um, you really start learning the neighborhoods on the reefs. So it isn't a great surprise to me that when I had to tr transition to land photography that I was drawn to learning about the biology of animals and plants that I was photographing. The problem was that land photography, I had to change my whole approach to light and, and exposure. I was no longer a flash photographer. Um, I could now shoot at high frame rates. Uh, you can't do that with flash because after two or three shots, the, it had, at least underwater, the strobes have to recharge. And I had an infinite number, infinite number of exposure choices, uh, which again, when you're underwater, um, exposures aren't limited, but you don't need to change exposure all that much. And so I really needed help. And, uh, and when we moved to Old Town, there was a fellow who was walking his dog on our block um, and we got talking about photography. And he said, I should come to a meeting of a club that he belonged to, the Northern Virginia Photographic Society. So I went and went to a couple of meetings. And at one of the meetings, they had a speaker, Nikhil Ball. And I'm sure all of you know Nikhil. Um, I'm sure Nikhil's probably talked to you as well. If he hasn't, he should. Um, he's a wonderful photographer. Um, I really, really enjoyed his talk and, and what he was uh, showing. And after the talk, I... Um, so I introduced myself and I said, I, I need somebody to teach me how to photograph on land. And um, I explained to him the situation and he sort of laughed. And he said, well, I'm doing a small workshop at one of the local uh, uh, gardens and why don't you come? And it was a workshop on flowers. Well, very quickly over time, Nikhil and I became um, very good friends and I spent time with him in Chincoteague, if any of you been to Chincoteague with Nikhil, you know that he is truly a biologist about the area. 
Um, he's done work for the uh, park rangers there, uh, the park system. Um, he knows a tremendous amount about the biology and the ecology of the area. Um, and since my first trip there, I've been down there many, many times and often uh, with Nikhil. I went with him to the Smoky Mountains and dusted off my slow shutter speed photography, which I love to use underwater. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, was drawn to waterfalls and, river, and rivers and streams. And I went to him uh, for, my, for my first time um, to uh, Bosque del Apache. I have been there subsequently. And I was introduced to bird photography. And this picture sort of reminds me a little bit about the, that school of fish picture that I showed earlier. Um, and I really uh, uh, started to enjoy learning about species of birds and where to photograph them and how to photograph them. So Nikhil became a mentor. And at the same time, um, on a Sunday morning, and about, I think it was probably around 2013, I. I think I had the flu, but what, for whatever reason, I was watching channel surfing TV and I came to an NPR um, show about photography sponsored by Canon. And I think it was George Lepp and he was introducing and he was uh, interviewing a young photographer, a fellow in his 20s in outside of Seattle, Washington on the Olympic Peninsula. And his name was Aaron Bagenstoss. And I enjoyed listening to Aaron and I thought, that's pretty cool. Uh, I wouldn't mind trying some photography there. And so I found out how to get in touch with Aaron and called him. And he said, well, I'm doing a, a workshop on the Skagit River photographing eagles in December. And he said, you're welcome to come. And basically what you do is you drive up river and you get on these uh, pontoon boats and the guy with the oars keeps you close to the shore as you're going down river and you shoot eagles. And the eagles are there because the salmon have finished spawning and they're now dying. There's a swimming dead. And if they come shallow, the eagles will grab them and pull them up on the bank and then fight over who gets to eat them. And it was a tremendous trip. Aaron was a, a great teacher, very knowledgeable, um, despite the fact that he was 40 years younger than I am. Um, I've learned a lot from him. This is uh, Aaron here. Um, and it also was my first exposure to cold weather photography because Seattle, Washington State uh, along the Puget Sound in December, it just has ugly weather. It doesn't really snow and it doesn't really rain. It sort of slushes and it's cold and it's wet. And even the eagles don't look happy. Um, but there was, it's a target rich area for photographing uh, eagles. Um, and it's where I started to learn about photographing birds in flight. Um, and uh, it was really a tremendous experience. About a month after that workshop, I got that somewhat unexpected call from Aaron, who said that he was told me, he said, I want to run workshops <clears throat> in Yellowstone in the fall and the spring. And he said, I plan on using two SUVs and having three photographers in each SUV. And he says, for that, I need a driver and I need an interpreter. And I sort of laughed and I said, well, what do you mean by interpreter? He said, well, I'm 27 years old and all of my clients are in their 60s and 70s. <laughs> and I said, I need you there as a buffer. And I said, well, that sounds good. And so um, I signed up to help him uh, with his uh, first workshop uh, in Yellowstone. Hey, Stan. I um, needed to learn something about it. Yes. Uh, there's a question in chat real quick, uh, and it, it's relevant to this. Uh, it, their question is, what is Aaron's last name? Bagenstos, B-A-G-G-E-N-S-T-O-S. And I can give you the particulars on that afterwards. Sounds great, thanks. Um, I had to learn about the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Yellowstone National Park is basically an arbitrary area that was based on the geysers. Um, and right below it is the Tetons Grand, uh, National Park. 
But the greater Yellowstone ecosystem covers several ranges of mountains. And it has to do with the migration of uh, mule deer, elk, uh, um, bighorn sheep, pronghorn antelope, all have summer and winter areas in the greater eco Yellowstone ecosystem. And the problem is that the jurisdiction is three different states. Um, some of it is federal, some of it is state, some of it is private. Um, and so maintaining this area is really very difficult. However, Yellowstone has been set aside. Um, and so it is fairly pristine you know, for that um, area uh, and uh, offers just a target rich photographic area. So it was our plan to have the group of photographers arrive in Bozeman. Um, we pick them up, drive down to Gardner, and then tour Yellowstone for three days, drive down into the Tetons, tour the Tetons for three days, drop them off in Jackson, take a day's rest, pick up a group in Jackson, and do the reverse trip and finish again in Bosman. And so that was the deal. And we started out um, on our Yellowstone workshops. I love this view of the Lamar Valley um, with parts of the Absaroka Range behind it. When you drive down the road to the Lamar, you come through this small canyon of the Lamar River and it, you don't see the Lamar Valley right away. And you come down a little hill, and I love anybody who hasn't been to Yellowstone that's in the car. I say, okay, open your window. I don't care what the temperature, open your window, look out to the right, because this is a fantastic view. And you slow the car down and just take in the Lamar Valley. I've never been to Africa, but this is described as the Serengeti of the Americas. And it can be full of bison. It can have no bison. It can have snow, terrible weather, rain, or it can be gorgeous. It doesn't matter. And if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes, it'll change. Um, but it is just an awesome spectacle. In the springtime, which was our first trip, it's a time of renewal. I, all the animals look like they're just thankful that they made it through the winter. And of course, it's the birthing time. Um, this cow bison is shedding her winter coat, uh, rolling around in a, a hollow here of mud that helps scratch the coat off. And this is her two to three day old uh, calf, um, affectionately known as red dogs. The young um, bull bison have nothing to do in the spring and um, and summer, uh, and in fact, in the fall too, because they're really too young to be mating. And so they form these bachelor herds of just boys, and all they can do is figure out how to spar and, and fatten up for the winter. The other animals are glad to come out of their hibernation, and this um, marmot here is so pregnant, you can't really see her belly, but it is just ready to explode. And she's looking at us. Uh, you can actually see the photographers in her eyes here. Um, she has a burrow in the back in the rocks there, and she is padding that with fresh grass and dry grass for a birthing chamber. Um, and she really didn't have time to fool with us because she knew she was about to have her babies. So our, winter, our spring trip was um, really successful and uh, we had a lot of fun with our two groups. Um, and we got to learn a lot about Yellowstone and um, special places that we like to photograph and where we could find animals. And so the next trip was in the fall. And uh, this particular trip started out in the Tetons um, and the Tetons are just absolutely stunning in the fall. Um, the aspens are turning yellow and um, the lighting is fantastic. It can snow uh, at any moment as well. Uh, we've been there several times when we had a couple of inches of snow. The problem with that is, is that it weights down the uh, leaves on the aspen, which are easy to fall off and you can have beautiful leaves one day and nothing the next. 
This is the Snake River um, and the famous Oxbow Bend. The only thing it's missing is a nice big bull moose standing out here somewhere. Um, but it is indeed a gorgeous area. But the fall is the time of the rut. Um, and uh, all animals are um, trying to procreate. And this is a gorgeous um, bull elk who's bugling on a cold, crisp morning. The sound is just gives you goosebumps. It's once you hear it, you'll never forget it. Um, and it's quite spectacular. And they spend all of their time bugling. And then this is a scent gland right here under the eye. And they rub that on the bushes and the trees to let everybody, all the other males know that this is my territory and this is my harem. Well, not everybody gets the message. And here's a younger, not quite as large bull who's thinking he can sneak around the back and maybe snare a couple of females. Um, it had started raining by that time. Um, and so the very low light, um, and, and again, I love doing slow shutter speed photography. This is a pan blur in the rain. And this is the object of uh, all of the commotion. Uh, this is the harem of that big bull. Um, not all of them are breeding females. There's some young yearlings in there. And if they're, if they're a year old, their mother is still with them. They aren't um, going to breed that year. It's, it's not until their uh, kids are two years old, very much like our white-tailed deer. And then, of course, these females are looking around to see, well, you know, who's the best looking male? Who are we going to, you know, side up with? But that big bull, he's going to win that argument. The pronghorn sheep don't have quite as big a heron, but they spend as much energy trying to keep them under control. Um, this was a beautiful uh, fall uh, grass field in, in, in brown color. And this pronghorn was running back and forth and back and forth, chasing away younger males. Um, and again, great time to do um, pan blurs um, to catch the action of the pronghorn. And this old bull moose, um, we were between, between trips and it was raining and Aaron's had held back to do some paperwork. And I took the car and went up to a place to grow on where moose are known to happen. And there was nobody out there. And I pulled over on a side road and this big old bull moose came down the field right at the car, just walking slowly along. And he came up to the passenger side and I got out on the driver's side and started taking pictures. And He's got bloodshot eyes and he's just got a runny nose and everything about him says, I just want, I've been servicing the ladies all night long. I just want to lay down somewhere and get out of the rain. The fall was also the time that I saw my first great gray. Um, and I was absolutely addicted to these birds. These owls are just spectacular. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that we were with a group just outside of the Yellowstone Lake Lodge um, where a young great gray was hunting and he stayed there for an hour hunting and allowed us some really spectacular shots of uh, this bird as he was uh, searching for his prey. Otters are there, but they're hard to see because they're always moving. Uh, in this particular case, this is a mom and pop otter, the father's on the left, and they're just sitting there watching their three pups that are in the water. The pups have been broke. This is the fall and they were born in the spring and the, the pups are playing with a dead fish and they're just sitting there, you know, kids will be kids. The fall, as I said, is a gorgeous time to be in the, in the Tetons. Um, those of you who've been there will recognize Schwabacher's Landing. If you want to take these pictures, you got to be there about an hour before sunrise because you won't find a place to put your tripod. It's really busy when the leaves are turning. Uh, the photographers and the photo groups are out in force. This was taken from the Jackson Lake the Jackson Lake Lodge um, restaurant. Aaron and I were having dinner between meetings. We sat down um, by one of their big bay windows and this sunset started to form over Mount Moran and our cameras were, and tripods were in the car. And we jumped up from our meal, ran outside and started, got our cameras in the parking lot and our tripods and started taking pictures. 
And the rest people in the restaurant thought we were crazy. And we finished and we came back in and the waiter was laughing at us. He took all our plates and food away, went back to the kitchen, brought out a whole new hot meal. Um, but, we, but we got these pictures. This was the beginning of the end of our fall and winter trips, uh, fall and spring trips to uh, Yellowstone and the Tetons. It was getting more and more crowded. This is Rosie the black bear. She's very well known at Tower Junction. She's known because she's such a good mother. And she's very people savvy and she shows up um, and just poses for everybody. And when she shows up, there's a bear jam. And this is a small bear jam. When you're in Yellowstone and you want to stop to take a picture, you have to park your car outside of these dotted lines. And these, there's not always a place to park. So if you're running a photo tour, sometimes you have to drop off your photographers and then drive a mile up the road to find a place to park and then walk back. And it was getting harder and harder to do that. And Rosie was sitting up here somewhere and everybody was taking her pictures as we were leaving. Because we had been there an hour early when Rosie had brought her three cubs down into the field um, to have them frolic around in the tall grasses. And when photographers started to show up, she just made a little grunt and they followed her up the hill and she made another grunt and they went up in a tree. And then she came back down and posed for the photographers. Well, after that trip, as we, Aaron and I were at the airport, we had lunch waiting for our flights. And Aaron turned to me and said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's too much driving and it's too many people. And I just started laughing. And I said, well, how do you think I feel? I'm 40 years older than you are. And he said, I want to think about coming to Yellowstone in the winter. And I said, OK, I'll let you know how it is. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because in January, I'm going to Yellowstone with Nikhil Ball, who has asked me to help him um, with the Yellowstone trip there. He's leading a trip for Naturescapes, and he knows I've been to Yellowstone with you a whole bunch of times. So he said, um, could I, he asked me if I would come and drive the second car. And of course I said, sure. So he said, all right, well, tell me how it is. Well, Yellowstone in the winter is a completely different game. This is Gardner, Montana up here. And these are the roads in Yellowstone in Brown. And every single road in Yellowstone is closed, but for one. And that's this road from Gardner, Montana to Cook City. The road out of Cook City goes through a mountain pass and is closed, but you can go from Cook City on a plowed road to Gardner. And that's because 80 people live in Cook City and they need a way out. Everything else is closed to vehicular traffic. When we were there in this fall and the spring, we would drive this area, here's the Lamar Valley up here, um, Swan Flats up here, Cannon Village. This is the um, uh, Yellowstone River uh, Canyon, Grand Canyon with the Upper Falls. This is uh, Yellowstone Lake. This is where that great gray owl was. All of these areas are target rich. We never went down to Old Faithful. I never saw Old Faithful. The only, only time I'd seen Old Faithful was in 1958 when I was 10 years old and went to Yellowstone with my parents and fed the bears through the car window. Um, and we didn't go down there on purpose because it's just so crowded. Now, all these roads are closed to vehicular traffic. So the typical trip is to go to Gardner and drive this road for three days, concentrating mostly in this area of the Lamar Valley and this area that's called Little America's um, for the wildlife, winter wildlife that's here. And after that, you go to West Yellowstone, but you can't come this way, which is like maybe an hour drive. You have to go back up through Bosman and down, which is about a three hour drive if it's not snowing like crazy. And you stay in West Yellowstone. And then you have to be in a guided vehicle of some form to travel these roads. And basically 
this road is open, this road is open, and uh, this road through um, to Hayden Valley um, and the uh, Greater Falls um, is open. So you need a means of transportation. Um, these Bombardier half tracks are the oldest ones that are available. They fit for people not comfortably and they are exceedingly noisy. I don't know that you can hear anything uh, after two days in one of those, but they have a pop top. And if you see something that you wanna take a picture of, you can stand up and take a picture. You can also travel by snowmobile, um, but there are two guides for the snowmobile and they'll take anywhere from 10 to 15 snowmobiles with a guide in the front, a guide in the back. You don't have to know anything about a snowmobile. They'll give you the clothing and they'll teach you how to drive them. And it's not surprising that a number of people end up face first in trees um, along the road. The problem with the snowmobiles for me is I don't know where you put the tripod of the 600 millimeter lens and certainly the windshield factor has got to play in. So the way you get around as a photo group is by snow coach. And they come in various sizes and um, various uh, modes. And the reason is, is that the roads are not plowed. They're packed. Every night, a, a, a team of gigantic tractors pull these sleds that are weighted with several tons of concrete. And they smooth out the road surface and the fresh snow that's on the road. So there may be six, eight, 10 inches of snow on the road. And then as soon as you get off to the side, there may be two, three, four, five, six feet of snow. Um, so they're equipped with these heavy duty tires or half track and skis. Um, this particular size vehicle and this company is the one that we use. Um, and it fits the driver and uh, the eight people, the, the six photographers, the two guides, fairly comfortable. It's crowded, but it's reasonable. And you're in it all day. They have a packed lunch for you. Uh, everybody figures out their own little space and how to get in and out of the vehicle um, quickly. Um, so uh, it's a great way to go, but uh, they're expensive. So you're not just going to go hire a snow coach on your own. Um, and so unless you know your way around and have a group of people to help split the cost with, you're best off going with a photo group. They're not perfect on these packed roads. And if you catch a rut and start sliding, you go off the road, you're stuck. And this is to the entrance to the Hayden Valley. It's a two and a half hour drive from West Yellowstone. And if this other truck from the company hadn't been there to pull us out, we would have been there for six, eight hours. Um, just to get help. Uh, but all of them are equipped with tow ropes, shovels, blankets, etc. That little adventure was not without some dentation to the uh, snow coach. Um, people got jostled around a little bit. Um, so certainly uh, an adventure to say the least. But the benefits are there's nobody there. That's not totally true. Of course, you see other snow coaches and you see other uh, snowmobiles and the occasional cross country skier, but it's so spread out that it's just delightful. And here, this is actually people will recognize Nikhil standing here. Um, if you see something you want to photograph, you just stop and get out and sit on the road and start taking pictures. And it's rare that you have to, you know, move along. If you decide to get off the road, and you don't usually, if you're, if you're in the lower or upper geyser basin, you're not going to walk off the road because you, there can be thermals that are covered with snow. This is up in the Hayden Valley. This is Aaron Bagenstoss, and he decided he wanted to get low. Well, he didn't realize that this was a like three foot snow drift, but uh, he got low. It took two of us to get him out. Though. So how do you stay warm in all of this? Well, it's all about layers, multiple, multiple layers, and a large roller bag for check-in on the airplane. I wear two sets of long underwear, a base layer, and then usually something like a smart wool layer of long underwear, top and bottom, for starters. On the top, I then have a winter-type 
shirt or sweater um, that has a hood um, that is a tight fitting hood over my head. And if it's gonna be particularly cold, I'll wear a down vest and it's followed by an, a jacket. And there are all kinds of winter weather jackets, some exceedingly expensive. I have really enjoyed this particular Columbia jacket, not in red, because it has this uh, down inside liner, which has this stuff called Thinsulate, which radiates your heat back. Then it has uh, uh, this uh, outer shell, um, which is waterproof, um, and a hood on that as well. For your legs, I use snow pants, snowboarding pants, um, which are pretty easy to get on. They're easy to walk around in. They have um, uh, these uh, tight um, bands for around your ankles so that snow doesn't get up in them. Um, but they're not waterproof. They're water resistant, but not waterproof. And so over that, I wear a standard rain pants that are waterproof and also work as a, a barrier uh, to wind. Uh, and help um, keep cold off. So as far as your legs and your torso and your head are concerned, and it's important to wear, you know, a hat, a wool cap, and then, you know, a hood over top of that, where because you, you lose a lot of heat through your head. As far as those areas are concerned, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to stay warm. Feet are a problem. If you're standing in a, one place for a long period of time, your feet can get cold. Um, I have a base layer of socks, and then I wear some thermal socks. The best thermal socks I have, I bought at Ace Hardware. And it's just a cotton knit sock that has this fluffy stuff inside it that retains heat, and they're pretty remarkable. Um, I wear a hiking shoe that is winter hiking. It's just a Merrill winter hiking boot, um, uh, ankle up over the ankle, um, lace up. If it's going to be cold, I'll put a chemical uh, foot warmer uh, inside. And then over that, I wear these Neos. Um, this is a neoprene galoshes. Uh, they're 100% waterproof. They cinch up around the area to calf um, to keep the snow out. And it gives you an extra layer, A, to keep you dry, and B, to hold in the heat. And it works very, very well. They actually make a winter Neo as well. I have just the regular Neos, so I sometimes wear them in the summer if I'm gonna be in water, um, standing in water and streams to photograph. But it works pretty well and uh, my feet do okay. I have no solution for your hands. I have more winter gloves than a PGA Tour Pro has putters. I, you just try everything. Now I haven't tried the recent um, new electric gloves that have rechargeable USB batteries, um, but um, it's hard to keep your hands warm. These are the photographer's photographer glove. Um, these are the heat company gloves. They're expensive. Uh, they come in two varieties. One is a shell with a sewn in inner glove. And the other is a shell that is separate from the inner gloves. And you buy the shell and you buy the inner gloves. Don't buy the sewn in ones because the inner glove wears out. And if it wears out, then you got to buy the whole system. If you have the independent system with the shell and the inner glove, you can buy as many pairs of inner gloves as you want. The shells themselves um, don't wear out. And they have a zipper across the palm so that you can fold it back and expose the fingers with touch pads and expose the thumb. They have a, a zipper across the back where you can put in one of the chemical heat things in there. To me, it makes no sense to put a heat warmer on the back of your hand because that's not where the arteries are that are carrying blood flow to your fingers. The arteries are the palmar arch or arteries in the palm of your hand. You really need to put your of chemical heat warmers in the palm and warm up the palm of your hands and that'll carry the warm blood to your fingertips. It's a great suggestion, but again, you still have to have these fingertips exposed and they get cold. And when they get really cold, you can't feel the buttons on your camera. The only solution that I have in addition to the gloves are hand warmers. 
And these are electric hand warmers that charge with USB uh, cords uh, so that you can recharge them in your car if you want. Um, Zippo makes one, uh, REI carries a couple of brands. They heat to 120 degrees. And the trick is not to hold them in your hand outside in the air because nothing is warm enough to combat minus 10 degrees. As soon as you get out of the car, get out of the snow coat, you turn these on, you put them in your insulated coat pocket and you zip up the pocket and then you're photographing. If your hand becomes cold, then you stick it in your pocket and you've got this little oven and that warms up your hand. And in fact, if it's in the 20s or 30s, I don't wear a glove uh, on my right hand. Um, I just keep my hand in my pocket um, until I want to start taking pictures. Some people, if they're shooting landscapes, will actually put a remote in their pocket and just not take their hands out of their pocket at all um, and use the remote. So other considerations about when it's really cold uh, is that your cameras can freeze. Um, I haven't seen that happen as much with newer prosumer and pro cameras. And the fact that your cold fingers can't feel anything when they're really cold. Batteries drain faster in the cold, so it's always good to take lots of batteries. Keep one battery uh, inside your coat pocket, uh, in the breast pocket, um, so it stays warm. I travel uh, to Yellowstone with monopods and a tripod. Tripods are great if you've got sort of a stationary um, subject because you can leave your camera unattended and stick your hands in your pocket. Um, monopods are great if you need to move around. If you're following coyotes or a moose or something like that, then the monopod is lighter and you can actually stick a monopod in a snow drip um, and that'll take, you know, it'll hold it up some, but it'll actually make it more steady. Exposing for snow um, takes some practice. In the old days of film, cam film cameras, you always were taught to take a meter reading and then add two stops of light so that the snow would be white. Well, with today's digital cameras, um, you've got histograms and highlight warnings, blinkies, and when you have the mirrorless digital cameras, you've got real-time um, uh, histograms in your electronic viewfinder and real-time blinkies if you want to turn those on as well. So if you're shooting in low light, like early in the morning, um, you really want to expose, and you're shooting dark animals, you really want to expose for that animal. Um, because if you underexpose this animal, and then in post-processing, you want to bring up the shadows, you're going to create noise every single time. So it's better to shoot this um, with the histogram to the right um, at an ISO 6400. And if you need to take the exposure down than is to shoot it at 3200 underexposed, you'll get more noise um, taking it up. And because you are uh, trying to expose to the right, anything in the early morning hours in low light, any snow is going to turn out to be uh, relatively white for sure. Well, if you're lucky enough to see a long-tailed weasel, they have their winter coat, which is white. And these white weasels all get called ermines, but there are weasels and stoats. And um, so all manner of weasley animals get called ermine. This fellow popped down into this hole and we stood there for 45 minutes, hoping that he would come back out, not knowing until afterwards that I learned and Aaron learned that these guys have a myriad of tunnels under the snow. So he could have come out in Idaho somewhere um, and we wouldn't have known it. But we waited there and as the light started to fade in the evening, I kept exposing for the snow, exposing for the snow, taking text, um, test pictures, hoping that this guy would pop out. And he did. And I got at 15 frames per second, I got two shots, only one where his full head was out. And when I looked at my LCD screen, the whole thing was blinkies. And I thought, oh, now nah, I've just blown that picture. But our LCD, our LCD screen and the histogram and the blinkies are all based on JPEG. And so you've got a little margin for error. And when I got back to the hotel that night and dropped the exposure down about two stops, the weasel magically appeared. 
as did the shadows in the snow. The snow is still blown out, but who cares? The weasel is just enough darker than the snow to have been exposed correctly for. So with all of that in mind, is it worth going to go through the cold, to go at a time when a lot of the animals are hibernating, like the grizzlies and the black bears and uh, the badgers and the marmots, they're all, none of them are there. I mean, they're, except for swans and eagles and ravens and magpies, there aren't any birds to speak of. So why do you go in the winter? Because it's an absolutely magical place. The scenery, whether it's up close or panoramic, is breathtaking around every single corner. Um, it's just beautiful. And even a simple photograph in the Lamar Valley on a gray day, uh, letting some of the snow <clears throat> be slightly underexposed because you know it's going to be a black and white picture. It's a black and white landscape. Um, everything is just awesome. There is some color. Uh, this is uh, the first, this is the, my first trip to uh, Old Faithful um, from before, 19, after 1958. Old Faithful is way to the left. Um, this is up on the boardwalk looking down at uh, Castle Geyser. Um, and the only problem is, is that this buffalo wouldn't, excuse me, bison, probably because I call him a buffalo, uh, this bison wouldn't sit over here for me. But um, the whole area, the scenery, and the, the, the mass area is, is spectacular. The early morning mist that comes off of the rivers. Many of the ri rivers are thermally heated. They don't freeze. They stay about 40 degrees in the winter, um, creating a mist at sunrise uh, that is just awesome. The, um, the trees, the aspen trees that are so beautiful in the spring and fall are now just etchings. They're just these skeletal etchings with uh, you know detail uh, as they're uh, high keyed off of the snow. And if you get a cold, cold morning, it was minus 10 on this morning with a, a hard, hard um, hoar frost. Um, it stuff looks like glass. And no, this not, is not an infrared image. This is just the hoar frost on the cottonwood trees. Up at Mammoth Springs, uh, Mammoth Hot Springs, uh, it looks like a Halloween picture at, at sunrise with these um, ghostly colors and these trees that have died from the sulfuric fumes. Um, again, every place you look, there's another picture to be taken. Uh, Fountain Geyser, um, this is a Roshark test for you all. You can decide what you, what you see in these, uh, this geyser going off. I have old man winter up here. You can see his cheeks and his mouth and his nose and his eyes his hat and his hair going out the back. He's blowing up this big cold storm and this poor fox is cold. Here's the ear of the fox and the muzzle and the eye. You guys can see whatever else you wanna see in that. But because the air is so cold, the geyser steam just makes these amazing um, sculptures you know, of clouds. This is the most photographed tree in in uh, Yellowstone, this is in Hayden Valley. It's a uh, lodgepole pine that was split by lightning. And I think it's dying and probably won't be there for many more years. Um, all the times that I go there, that's, it's either overcast or a bald sky just blue. And so I very rarely include much sky uh, in the images. And I always take pictures when you go there, even though I've been there a bunch of times. On one trip, it had snowed about oh, 10 or 12 inches and we didn't think we were gonna to get to the Hayden Valley because we, it's a long drive and the roads are easily drifted and they can be closed. But they had gotten them uh, manicured and so we got up there and there were these fantastic drifts on the hills and they were these uh, late storm clouds and of course, the tree. 
the very first year that I saw this tree, this, it was an overcast day and I just wasn't feeling it. And so I took out my 600 millimeter lens and I said, I'm just gonna take a picture of the tree with the white background and get the shadow of the tree and have that be it. Well, when I processed the image after the trip, got home, because I wasn't impressed that it wasn't gonna be that much of an image, the contour of the snow was still there. And unbeknownst to me, when I took the picture, a fox had slept under that tree at some point. And during the course of the day, before we got there, he had walked out and walked up the hill. And this is one of my favorite pictures from Yellowstone. And it was just completely serendipitous. With all of this beauty that is around you, there is this juxtaposition of what's happening to the animals. They are just trying to stay alive. Um, they, it, it looks like they're suffering. I know they're not because they know how to do it and they're equipped to do it. But nonetheless, it just looks like they're having a hard time. This is a big, big bull bison. They spend their whole winters by themselves. They may buddy up with another bull, but most of the time they're alone. And it was snowing like crazy. The wind was blowing things sideways. And this magpie Jay knew a warm spot when he could find it. In fact, um, when I first saw him, he was down here snuggled in the neck. Um, but when he saw us, it hopped up here uh, just so he could, if he had to make a getaway. But he didn't want to fly because the wind and the snow was ferocious. And every once in a while, this bull would stand up and shake off the snow. And the magpie jay still didn't want to leave. So he would hang on for dear life and wait for the bison to settle down again. The coyotes are equipped to be there as well. Um, they're very good hunters. They can find rodents under the snow, um, in the grasses. Um, and they will find also um, carrion. But when it's, this is again in the Hayden Valley and the snow was whipping around, it, it, I was uncomfortable. And I guess that's probably why I thought the animals had to be uncomfortable as well. The moose are pretty well equipped to be out there in the winter. Um, and they don't look too particularly perturbed. This is a female moose and it's yearling. Uh, crossing uh, Pebble Creek uh, up at the very top of the Lamar. And the bull moose, certainly the healthy big guys, um, I mean, they're doing fine. They don't have any predators that pay. There's, the wolves are not going to pay attention to this animal. He's just too big. Um, they can still get some nutrition from the willows. Um, he is yet for some odd reason uh, at the time of taking this picture, he has yet to drop his, uh, his antlers, um, which they do in the winter. So that was a bonus. The bighorn sheep hang out up on the craggy areas. Uh, the wolves aren't gonna come up there and hunt in mass. I don't know how they find anything to eat, but they come down and eat the dry grasses and hang out. This big ram, um, is at the top of the Lamar. There's two rams that have been at, that have I'm sure they're the same rams that have been there, uh, I don't know, 10 years running for me anyway. And if they're not the same rams, they sure look like they are. Anytime there's a carcass, everybody lines up for their chance. Uh, this could have been a kill or it could have been a natural demise of this young bison. The wolves have already been there and had their fill. They've eaten the liver and the spleen and the kidneys and all of the big meat. And they leave basically just bone and sinew. Um, the uh, coyotes hang out around the periphery of the wolves. And if one gets too close, the wolves will take out a coyote and they won't eat it. They'll just leave it there as a marker, like to the other coyotes, you know, just don't mess with our pack. But they get their chance um, at, the, at the carcass, and that certainly is a, a feast for them. This young coyote has pulled off a, a bit of skin and whatever, and is sort of eating by himself, not getting in trouble with the older coyotes. And this magpie, Jay, is waiting his turn. 
The fox too will take uh, advantage of carry on, but they're also excellent hunters of rodents that are buried under the snow. They are magnificent in the winter. It's my favorite animal. And they're well equipped to be cold. If it's snowing really hard, they'll just lay down and they'll take their bushy tail and curl up and put the tail over their face and ears and they'll just go to sleep. They are not perturbed by it at all. But when there's a carcass to be had, these are solitary animals in the winter. Um, when there's a carcass to be had, they'll all find it. Um, they'll argue over it, but they'll find it. At one point, there were seven fox on this, on this uh, carcass. And the ravens and the magpie jay are waiting their turn. One scavenger that doesn't wait and will come in any damn time they please are the eagles, the golden eagles and the bald eagles. Even wolves sometimes will back off. If they're not, a, if they're not, you know, one, if there's one or two wolves on a carcass, they'll back away from an eagle. They just won't risk losing an eye to uh, these guys, to their talons or their beak. Um, and the eagles will come in and get their fill, but they'll announce to everybody around, you know, this is our, uh, this is our carcass right now. And don't bother us. Well. I've been actually um, in the introduction and said I've been there 14 times. I've been there in the warm weather 14 times and I've been there in the cold weather five. Um, and just about every time, not every time, but just about every time we've seen wolves. And the wolves are always far away and they're always pointed out by the wolf watchers with their scopes. And it's great to see them. I've had a couple of close encounters with them. Um, but always in the late evening, and I, I, I've dubbed them my ISO 6400 plus animal. I've never really gotten any great pictures of them. And this past January, when we were in um, the Lower Geyser Basin on the Fire um, Hole River, we had heard that the Wapiti Lake Pack was on the prowl. And so we drove up and down the road and up and down the road one afternoon looking for wolves. And we had been driving up and down in the snow coach um, for about 45 minutes. Uh, I was sitting in the shotgun seat next to the driver. Aaron was um, talking with the clients a little bit in the back. And I put my hand on the driver's arm and I said, wolves. And sure enough, around the corner came the wolves. And they were about uh, I'd say 250 yards away. We stopped the snow coach on the right-hand side of the road. Everybody quietly got out. Four people laid down behind the uh, left back wheel bumper and four of us laid behind, down in, by the right front wheel bumper so that we had view of the road. Thinking that the wolves would come pretty close, but then they would peel off and go on either side of the road. But like most animals in the winter, they didn't. They use the road as a thoroughfare because the snow is not really deep on the road, so it's easier to walk. And as we lay there, the wolves kept coming. And this was the first part of the Wapiti pack, which had 13 or 14 wolves. And there are six wolves in this picture. There's one back here, one here, and then the four coming along. We believe that this one here with the collar um, is the alpha female. And she is just a beautiful, beautiful animal. And they just came walking and walking. And we had two options. One was to get up and get back in the snow coach. And the other was just to lay there and keep taking pictures. And you know what option any of us would choose. And some of my friends have asked me, so well, weren't you scared? And I said, no. I, I said, yeah, I likened it to being underwater on a reef with sharks swimming around and photographing sharks. You don't think about being scared. You think you're in, you're in awe of the power of these apex predators. And these apex predators were exterminated from the lower 48 states in the 1920s. There weren't any. And these have only been re reintroduced to Yellowstone in the last 25 years. Um, and they've done well, um, but there, is, there are problems with wolves as they get outside of the park. Um, and it is an ongoing issue 
um, for sure about how to manage the wolf populations. But they kept coming and they kept coming. And here's the alpha female. This is the right-hand side of the road. And she is a road whip away from me. And the driver of the snow coach was also a photographer. He was lying next to me and he sort of nudged me. He said, look over there. And the wolf was just looking <laughs> right at us. And she was gorgeous and she started to go by us and then she turned around and gave us one last look. And I didn't photo, you know, Photoshop out the collar. I mean, this is the wolf. This is, you know, they're collared for research purposes and that's their life. But the only crop on this um, picture was a square crop for a portrait. Um, I was using a 200, 600 millimeter lens at 200 millimeters. And my ISO through this whole series was 320. The lighting was spectacular. And we were on this group of wolves for an hour because once they went by, we drove down the road, they had peeled off into the woods, we set up again and they kept coming. And here's another gray wolf. This is the black variant um, further down the road go back to that, um, they, they're so powerful. They go through this deep snow like nothing. They can run for hours at a time. Um, they are absolutely magnificent. And the only time that I had really sort of a drip of sweat rolled down my back was when this ginormous, and I don't know if this was a male or a female, but when this wolf who was 20, 30% bigger than any of the other wolves, stopped sniffing the turf for looking where his buddies were and, and picked up his head and looked at me. I thought, hmm, maybe he's having second thoughts about what really does constitute a meal, but um, an amazing, amazing animal. Um, this was another female, uh, not the alpha. Um, again, going up this slope, through the deep snow, um, beautiful, beautiful light. And then they cut out onto the Firehole Basin where there are hot springs um, and they crossed over that, they crossed over the Firehole River um, and they were gone. Uh, this was one of the last ones to come through on the pack before we, uh, they were too far away to get pictures. Um, too far away, if, if that had been where we had seen them and gotten pictures, we would have been ecstatic, except they were too far away after this experience. Um, but this one wolf turned again and, and looked back. It's a once in a lifetime experience, I'm sure. I don't think I'll ever, ever have an encounter like this again in my life, but it was really, really incredible. And then I have one other short story. Um, this occurred um, on the last day of one of our tours as we were driving out of the park. And the people, uh, the clients all wanted to get a picture of um, swans on the Madison River. And it was late in the afternoon and the Madison River um, gets, gets almost black in the, in the low light. And so you have these white swans on black water and it's spectacular. And the joke always is, can you get two swans that are facing each other and their beaks touch? And when their beaks touch, their necks curl and they shape, they make a shape like a heart. And so everybody wants to get the heart swan shots. So we got to uh, this pullout, we stopped. And it was about a 20 yard, 30 yard walk over to the edge of the Madison River where the swans were. And everybody got out and started over. And one of the photographers in the van said, you know, I really, I've got a bad knee and I just really don't want to walk through that snow um, to that. Uh, it's just, you know, I just can't do it. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll stay with you, but don't stay in the van. Let's just walk this five yards down this other direction where we're sort of at the edge of the of wa water. And let's just see, maybe we'll see something. And over a hill about, I don't know, 25 yards away came this massive bull bison. And he started walking along and I thought, well, we're going to have to get back in the van. 
But he sort of gave us a cursory look and then he turned and he walked across the mass. Apparently that was his crossing point. It was quite shallow there. And he walked across and he stood on the other side of the mass. And I said to her, I said, God, look at those trees. Look at this scene. This is just incredible. I said, maybe the bison will go up on the other bank. And she said, yeah, this is beautiful. I've got my shots. I'm going to go back in the snow coach. And I said, fine. And I said, you're okay. I'm going to stay out here. And sure enough, the bison walked up onto the bank and headed to the right where the trees started coming down towards the river a little bit more. And he stood there, but he stood with his butt to me. And the bison will stand in the snow and they'll use that big head and neck to sweep the snow away to get to the grass underneath. By the way, the grass offers little if no nutrition. They work on their stored fat all winter long. They eat the grass because they have to keep their um, back, gut bacteria satisfied. If they don't, the gut bacteria um, changes and it can be lethal. So they just have to have fiber in the gut. So I know from watching bison do this, that they sort of go clockwise or counterclockwise. So for a while, his head was at 12 o'clock and uh, his butt was at six o'clock facing me. And then he started turning and then his head was at three o'clock and I got some pictures and they were pretty cool. And at about that time he turned and his head was at six o'clock, but his head was down. He would never pick up his head, he was too busy eating. And I hear Aaron behind me said, we gotta go. I said, all right. And he said, I'm getting everybody in the, in the snow coach. And when he said that, his voice carried and the bison looked up. And this is my representation of Yellowstone in the winter. It is the combination of the beauty of the landscape with these wonderful snow laden lodgepole pines in the background, this little tributary of the Madison River, the Madison's down here, and this lonely bull bison that is on his own in this freezing cold environment, trying to survive till the spring. And with that, I will stop sharing and uh, turn it back over to, to John and we'll look and see about uh, answering questions. Yeah, there are a couple in the chat. Um, so the first question that was uh, not yet answered was, who makes the gloves that you're highlighting? Uh, it's called Heat Company. Heat Company? Heat Company. Right. They're made in, I think, Austria. Um, a guy named Charles Glasner, some of you may have heard of Awake the Light. It's a, uh, he, he runs photo tours and he is the U.S. representative. Uh, make sure you buy the U.S. Um, brand if you buy them from austria there's like a 60 dollars shipping fee <laughs> you don't you don't need that it's austria or S switzerland or something like that I'm, I'm not sure but it's someplace in europe but they have a a, a, a american outlet and so just okay. make sure you buy it from them all right and uh when you were shooting those wolves that you were talking about uh were you shooting a an aperture priority mode or a shutter priority um i'm a i'm a strictly manual guy that sometimes uses auto iso um and uh that was just uh manual and um the light was so wonderful the iso of 320 um i the when, they, when I was, I had a 200, 600 lens, when it's at 600, it's 6.3. Um, and I kept it around 7.1 um, uh, to keep the ISO at 320. And quite frankly, I was so in awe of the wolves, I didn't change anything after that. My shutter speed was 1600 and I just, I, I was just shooting. I just looked at the histogram um, and I looked at, quickly looked at a few of the uh, shots to see where the blinkies were. And after that, I forgot about exposures completely <laughs> and just kept shooting. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Remember, you're on mute, but feel free to come off mute and ask your question directly, or you can paste them in the chat. Um, I don't know how to get out. Oh, wait. Let me just escape here. That's what I got to do, isn't it? There. Photos yeah. oh, were stunning. Just... 
Um, I'm sure I, Tom has my email. I'm, I'm sorry, John has my email. And if anybody wants to contact me uh, directly, um, please uh, feel free. He also has my phone number. Um, feel free to call me. Um, uh, I'd be uh, uh, glad to answer uh, any questions um, that anybody has. Um, yes, B and H does also sell those gloves. I think. Um, but uh, you can go to their site um, to to um, get the to get the gloves. I mean, I would hope that anybody who gets to go to Yellowstone at any time, let alone the winter, I don't think you'd ever have an encounter with the wolves like that in in, in the spring or fall because there's just too many people. Um, and if the wolves got that close, uh, there would just be so many people there that they would just not show up. And be, if the wolves were in the area, the rangers would be in the area and the rangers would, you know, sort of police everything. We saw nobody. And I can't tell you, what, you know, how unusual that is to have nine people on 13 or 14 wolves for an hour, hour and a half, uh, photographing them at close range. It's, I mean, I wish everybody could, could have that experience because it's, um, I, I certainly will never forget it, that's for sure. Sounds like a great yeah. opportunity. Um, so, uh, there was a question, are you running a trip in 2023 by any chance? Um, we are. Um, I suspect that both Nikhil and um, Aaron are running trips in 2023. Um, I, they may be full. Um, if they want to get contact me, I can, I can find out. Um, I used to help both Nikhil and Aaron in the same winter. <laughs> but it's getting too hard to do that. And this winter, um, I, we stopped doing the eagle photography on the Skagit River in Washington because, and I helped him with six or seven, Aaron with six or seven workshops there because it just was, the weather was just so terrible. And um, this year we did our second eagle workshop in Homer, Alaska. Um, and that's a, a four day, four days of shooting in Homer and it, it's spectacular eagle photography. Uh, it does run the risk of being a single species shoot and you're in an area where weather can turn on a dime and you're, you require boats to get to the site going across the Kachemak Bay. Um, so you can get blown out pretty easily. And the two times that we've gone, for four days of shooting, we've missed both times. We missed one day because of weather, but you get twenty thousand eagle shots, so <laughs> you, you can afford to miss some. So it's hard for me to do. Uh, it's just a lot of, of traveling, a lot of you know, a lot of work, and a lot of time away from home. So, um, but I can it, please feel free to email me in, or you can you can go on Aaron's website um, or you can contact Nikhil. I'm sure you all know Nikhil, right? Um, yeah, you can contact yeah, Nikhil and see uh, when he's going. The advantage of going with a photo tour and especially with guys like Nikhil and Aaron is that A, we know the places to go and B, we know the good drivers for the snow coaches. And although they say you're not allowed to request them, we're pretty adamant about trying to get certain people to drive for us because uh, they the, the good guys are naturalists of their own right and some of them are photographers and so they know what you're looking for and they know about the lighting and stuff like that um, and so we're pretty careful about, um, careful about that it's aaron a-a-r-o-n baggenstoss b-a-g-g-e-n-s-t-o-s um, he has a great website with millions of trips and stuff on it um, so you can go and see um, um, if he has an opening. Um, he often does two trips in the winter, but not all, not always. And I don't help him with back-to-back -back trips anymore. <laughs> he has another fellow who's uh, quite a bit younger than I am, um, who helps him, who's also a lot of fun to be with as well. Okay. Cindy, did you have a comment? No, no. Okay, all right, so you come off mute, absolutely. You can, you'll be seeing these out your back porch, won't you? <laughs> Excuse me? You'll be seeing the wolves out your back porch. Um, 
Not <laughs> wolves, but there have been rumors that where I'm living, bears have walked up on the front porch. Yeah. So we're Grizzlies told. Grizzlies right, or black bear? Yeah. Brown bear? Grizzlies have been up, up there? No, I think it's a, I think it was a brown bear. That's before I moved here, but um, uh-huh. De- Denise and Jeff, who are lingering here, um, they live up on a mountain and they see everything um, except Bigfoot up there. <laughs> they, they've got uh, cameras all along their uh-huh. mountain and uh, they, they capture a lot of stuff. Although sometimes I think it's just Jeff dressed up as a bear. <laughs> or Bigfoot. <laughs> Bigfoot, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you know now, having been out there, how spectacular the country is. It's, it's just incredible. Yeah, a bunch of us, few people are on here tonight. We went back, I think it was February. And uh, I had only been there in the summer in like June, a couple years ago. And I was mesmerized by it and actually have reservations to go back in next January to stay in Gardner for about a week. Uh Um, Yeah. We'll drive in. So uh, it it is, it is where I, if anybody's, um, I'll, I'll just do a sales pitch. If anybody is considering going, I think winter is the time to go. There, there are no crowds. It's cold as hell, but it's absolutely probably some of the most beautiful countryside I've ever seen. You know, catching the animals, their wildlife, it's hit or miss. But we, we saw a lot. We had a great time photographing some otters in the river. Spent quite a bit of time doing that. Um, so it's well worth it. Yeah, and it's um, just the fact that there are no tour buses in the winter. That fact alone, you know, takes a couple of million people out of the park. So we, we, we actually did see one tour bus in the Lamar I, I, Valley. And it was strange because we had stopped at one of the outhouses and we saw the bus driving down the road and all of us said, we better get in line right now. <laughs> they were stopped. Otherwise, we would have been there for an hour. But otherwise, I, otherwise it's empty. I, um, I, 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 I didn't realize how, how difficult it was to navigate around crowds of people until I didn't have to. And when I got there in the winter and didn't have to deal with all of that, um, it, it just changes you. Um, yes, I, I don't have any great pictures of grizzly bears or badgers, and I would love to see them, or pine martens. I'd love to see all that stuff. But, um, you know, I, it, it, it's still target rich when you get there. Um, and, and it's fun to go with both Nikhil and, um, and Aaron, because Aaron is one of those people, if it doesn't have a heartbeat, he's not taking a picture. And Nikhil's one of those people who creates this beautiful art out of almost nothing. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's a great, great way to learn photography. Um, and I've been very fortunate to have him as mentor, so that's for sure. All right. Any other questions from anybody? Don't forget you're on mute. All right. Not seeing anybody in chat, yeah, not seeing, hearing anybody come off so mute. Uh, yes, again, again, Stan, great, great presentation. presentation. Uh, multiple comments, comments in the chat, chat as well on that topic. Thank, Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, experience. lovely photographs, and all, all your tips and tricks. You know, you know, obviously, as soon as we're recording this, so I'm sure people are going to be going back to, to get all your, all your tips here. So again, thank, thank you very much for coming out and sharing all of your insight with us. Um, hey, go ahead. Please feel free to contact me anytime. Um, I'm, I'm around and, uh, and be glad to help out. All right. One, 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 last, one, one last question, question got in just under the wire. <laughs> just under the the <laughs> What are your suggestions for keeping the equipment functional in such cold weather? Uh, that's a 
that's a good that's a good question, and I sort of glossed over that. Um, and I, I've got a few minutes. Uh, Steve Perry, I don't know if any of you know Steve Perry. He's a wildlife photographer, and he leads some tours. He doesn't do a lot of cold water photography, uh, cold weather photography, but he just wrote an article about photographing up in Wisconsin or someplace with his wife in cold weather. And he noticed with his 600 millimeter lens that a lot of the shots were soft and he couldn't figure out why it was. And then he tried something because he didn't know what to do. He took the lens hood off of his 600 and took the shots and compared them on, off, on, off. And the ones without the lens hood were sharp. And after a while, about being outside for 20, 30 minutes, he put the lens hood back on and those pictures were sharp. And what he realized was that the lens hood was retaining heat and, and that warm air in front of the lens was something that you were shooting through. And it's just like having that warm air off the hood of your car, don't you shoot across the hood of your car. And that was distorting the image. Well, we didn't know that specifically, but in order to keep your camera from fogging out every time you jump out of the car, when we're in the car or when we're in the snow coach, we've got the air conditioning on. And we've got the windows open sometimes. Everybody is dressed to the hill. So you're not, if you're not having cold air blown on you, you're just trying to warm up your hands when you're in the car or in the snow coach. You want to keep that as cool as possible so that when you jump out, the first thing that ha doesn't happen is that your lens fogs up. And so we generally don't have much of a problem um, with that. The other thing that people talk about all the time is, is that when your camera has been out in the cold all day long and you go back and take it into your hotel room, which is now 75 degrees, that you can get a lot of condensation and moisture inside the camera. And one of the things that people recommend is that have a garbage bag in your room. And as soon as you and put all of your camera gear away in your backpack, get it all stowed away before you go inside and take the backpack and put it in the garbage bag and close the garbage bag up and leave it and go have dinner. <laughs> and when you come back from dinner, the temperatures have slowly equalized and then you don't have that condensation problem um, on your gear. Um, the only caveat I would aim to add to that is take your, um, uh, take your cards out of the camera in the cold and stick it someplace where you won't forget them so that you can then process your pictures while the gear is warming up and you don't cheat and get in there and, uh, to, get your, uh, to get your cards. Um, and I can't say as I do that all the time, I've never had any trouble with moisture getting into my uh, cameras, uh, but um, I think it's a good tip. Um, and a lot of these hotels, super heat. I mean, God, they, they just, you know, they heat them up to like 80 degrees. They feel like they have to warm everybody up after they've come in from snow coaches and snowmobiles. But uh, it reminds me of some of the, the heating in Europe when I went over there in the wintertime. Yeah, I just, um, it's, it's, it was always too hot. But um, yeah, that's a, it's, that's, those are the two things that you've got to uh, be careful of. Um, otherwise, I think most modern day cameras are so well sealed and stuff like that. I just, I just haven't seen, I've seen one camera freeze up and that was 10 years ago in, in White Sands, New Mexico, when it was cold in the morning um, and it just stopped working. Uh, it started working again once, you know, the person put, um, they put it inside their coat and warmed it up some. And it's another um, reason why you should always take on wonderful trips like this, you've got to take two camera bodies. If you don't own two camera bodies, rent one, um, but you've got to have two camera bodies um, on these trips, because if one fails, you're just going to be heartbroken. And there's uh, another comment uh, regarding the, the, the bag idea that you had. Uh, you know, the comment is a red wants not to use plastic because it was not good for warming here. And the fabric was better. Do you have any thoughts on um, that? Well, your camera gear is in your is in your camera bag. 
so that is the interface between the plastic and the and 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 the gear as well. And so that's seems to be the, uh, the easiest way to do it. Some people don't bother with a plastic bag, they just don't take it out of their camera bag and because the camera bag retains a lot of the cold as well. It's been in the snow coach of the car and that's slowly warming up uh, over, over time. So it doesn't, you, you know, it doesn't allow the metal to go from, you know, minus 20 to 75 real quickly. All right, so uh, there's some discussion about batteries, and as we all know, the you know cold weather absolutely kills battery life. Right. Um, so obviously, you want to bring spare batteries so you can swap out on routine right. basis, and you probably want you probably recommend keeping your spare battery in um, an inside pocket close to body heat so you can keep it warm. Right. Right? Um, so my question, a variation of uh, comment that was in the in the chat, I'm going to turn it into a question. Uh, have you experienced on these trips that you've taken to Yellowstone such cold temperatures, have you experienced any significant difference in, in operational life, if you will, between a mirrorless, like, you know, perhaps a Fuji film or, or right. the new Icon Z or Canon R series? Have, you know, have you noticed any significant difference in battery and performance life in that cold temperature between those cameras and, say, a traditional DSLR? Um, for 40 years, I shot Nikon. And I shot um, all of their, you know, pro bodies in the digital series. Well, not all of them, but I had a D3S, a D4S, and a D5. And those cameras all took the brick. And that battery, you can't kill that battery. Um, and th they, their lifespan, was, it was tremendous. And I don't think I ever ran out of juice with one of those batteries with a lot of shooting. Um, the last two plus years I've been shooting with Sony um, and I have a Sony A1 and a Sony A92. Um, the battery grip takes two Sony, standard Sony batteries. Um, and most of photo tour shootings, you have a morning shoot, you stop for breakfast, lunch, something to eat, and you have an afternoon shoot, and you have dinner. Um, and so between shoots, I would look and see about what my battery life was, and I would change out um, batteries. But I never had to change a battery in the field. Okay. That doesn't really answer the question. It's just that, it, that you, I don't, I don't recall ever seeing both batteries worn down either. Um, I might get the second battery to like 75 and the first battery, you know, down to 20 and it switch over, switches over automatically at that point. Um, but I, I've never really had an issue with that. And that includes shooting birds in flight in Bosquet in the cold too, where you're shooting way, way more pictures than you do in Yellowstone. You know, you're shooting you know, a couple of thousand pictures in the morning, a couple of thousand in the afternoon. Um, so, and that's, uh, you're right, with the electronic viewfinder, that's a big, much bigger drain. Um, right. um, so. but, uh, another question has come up, uh, you like going back, back to that Zippo uh, heater that you were uh, showing earlier. Uh, um, would you consider putting, putting one of those in the camera bag itself? Um, probably wouldn't give off enough heat. And I don't really want to keep my gear warm. I want to keep my gear as close to ambient temperature that I'm shooting as possible. That even includes driving here in, you know, in 40 degree weather, um, taking my cameras out of the house and putting them in the back of the car. You know, I, I, I'm glad that I have an hour to drive someplace to go shoot because I, I keep the car pretty cool and let the, and let the cameras get to ambient um, temperature. Um, those hand warmers do work. Um, I think they're a godsend, um, but there it's a very focal heat. Um, if you, if it's, if it's 10 degrees and you take that and hold it in your hand in, outside in 10 degrees, it's not, it's going to lose heat almost instantly to the environment. It just can't overcome that cold, but in your pocket where you can store a little bit of heat, um, they, they work really well. I constantly have my bare hand in my pocket and I'm just twirling that thing around in my fingers until um, I get the feeling back and, <laughs> and then I start shooting again. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll second that because I have a couple electronic hand warmer, warmers that I keep in my pockets. I also had the chemical ones inside my gloves. My fingers got, you know, they get cold. I warm them up and, you know, I felt they were terrific. Mike, my, my experience with I think chemical. I'm going to buy another one or two next time I go. <laughs> my experience with chemical um, hand warmers is, is that when you get cold, when you get 15, 10 degrees, they don't, they just don't generate enough heat. And I tend to throw those in my pocket as well um, because they will generate heat. And what's, what's really funny is, is that, you know, after you get home and you get back in the room and you reach in to get the pot, the packet, it burns your hand. <laughs> and you go, well, where's all that heat been <laughs> all day long? And it's just, they you just can't do it. You right. also have to remember to take those chemical heaters out of the packaging for probably at least 10 minutes before 10, you 20 minutes before. Yeah. When you start out yeah. in the morning, um, you know, just open them up and, and let them, uh, Gain heat for like sure. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna put them in your you know your boots, you want to make sure that they're fully activated. And Zippo makes a butane hand warmer. You fill it with butane and you you light it and it keeps a little fire going on in there. Is it, was that um, and they're extremely warm. And the first time I was introduced to that was I went to Iceland with a friend who was a guy who taught me underwater photography, and he brought a butane hand warmer with him, but the butane got obviously confiscated <laughs> at, the, at the gate at the airport in the States. And we spent an hour walking around Reykjavik trying to find butane to fill his hand warmer. Um, and so I knew from that point on, you know, you, you're not going to travel with those. You might be able to use them around home, but you're not going to travel. So before the butane ones, there were Zippo made some, and I don't know what they used in it, some other form of gas, but we used to use those on the golf courses. We would wear those and carry them in our pockets in the winter. Yeah, you're carrying a little you're carrying a little fire around in your pocket so that <laughs> well I'm not so sure about that <laughs> it, it, it never never caught on fire i mean that and a bottle of scotch is all you need <laughs> you could say that about a lot of conditions <laughs> true that true that all right uh, uh it looks, looks like it's we've exhausted all of the questions, questions. uh you know, both online, online and in person. And again, Dan, can't, can't thank, thank you enough, enough for the, the talk. It's been a great engaging, engaging conversation tonight, and we, we hope to have you back, back sometime. Sure. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, we'd be glad to come back with something else to do. All right. <laughs> All right. right. Talk on the recording. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>